ágæta doktorsefni, góðu gestir, verðilegur handmælendur, distinguist opponents. The way it's happening today is that one of the opponents is not physically present, but is still present through teleconferencing and will take full part. So that's how it's going to happen. Uh, my name is Magnus Thumi Guðmundsson, as the president of, of the Faculty of Earth Sciences. I uh, ask you to enjoy this, this uh, uh, ceremony. And what's going to happen here is a PhD defense. Uh, it's Matilda Hermanska who is going to defend her thesis, Geochemistry of Supercritical Fluids in Active Geothermal Systems. Matilda Hermaska's supervisor has been Andri Stefansson, Professor of Geochemistry at the University of Iceland. Iceland. Other members of the committee have been Barbara Kleine, postdoctoral scientist at the Institute of Earth Sciences here at the University, Sigurður Reynig Gíslason, research professor at the Institute, uh, and uh, Thomas Driesner, professor at ETH in Zurich. He is not uh, present here today. Uh, Matilda Hermanska is from Prague, uh, Czech, uh, in the Czech Republic. Uh, she studied geology at the, the Charles University in Prague, where she focused on fluid flow in fossil hydrothermal systems in Central Europe. She obtained her bachelor's degree in 2010 and the master's degree three, days la three years later in 2013. Um, uh, soon after that, in 2014, she started her PhD studies here at the University of Iceland uh, under the supervision of Andri Stefansson uh, and as a part of the Geochem Network, where she worked on geochemical characteristics of supercritical fluids using modeling and experimental approaches. Opponents at the defense are Dr. Luigi Marini, geochemist, and Dr. Haldor Ármannsson, retired uh, geochemist at ESOR. Um, now, Luigi Marini, this is not his first, first time that he is uh, uh, an opponent at the PhD defense here. Uh, uh, he was here about 10 years ago as well. He is a highly experienced geochemist who is, a, is an expert on volcanic and geothermal gases and uh, geothermal aspects of geothermal uh, uh, and systems in Italy and elsewhere. Haldor Ormansson has had a long career in geochemistry and worked at the Iceland Geosurvey, ESOR. He is a well-known expert on environmental geochemistry and has worked extensively on geothermal gases, uh, notably in Iceland and Africa. The PhD defense begins with the candidate presenting the results of her work, followed by examination of the opponents, who will discuss the thesis, ask questions, and the candidate will answer. According to the regulation of the, un of the University of Iceland, others who are not opponents can discuss the work of the candidate if they have requested to do so 24 hours in advance. Uh, nobody has made such a request. But I will, however, make allow short questions or comments from the audience uh, following the opponent's questioning. So, uh, Haldor and, and uh, Luigi, I have uh, explained the proceedings of the defense. The candidate will now present an overview of her research. And Haldor, I suggest that you take a seat on, in, in the front row, so you better, much better for the neck. Um, and uh, so you can follow the presentation. And Matilda, you can begin your presentation. Should we maybe um, close the curtains? Yeah, there is somebody, there is a technician who does that uh, at some point. Uh, okay. I hope so. <laughs> so, um, thank you, Magnus, for introducing me. Um, good afternoon. Thank you, everyone, for coming to my PhD defense. My name is Matilda Hermanska, and past two years I have been working on geochemistry of supercritical fluids in active geothermal systems. Oops. Sorry. 
Um, in my talk, first, I will explain what do we mean by supercritical fluids in active geothermal systems, how do they form, and which pieces are still missing. This will lead to... <laughs> Maybe a little bit the light as well. This is great. Thank you. So in my talk first, I will explain what do we mean by supercritical fluids in active geothermal systems, how do they form, and which pieces are still missing. This will lead to a research question that shapes uh, my project. Um, then I will proceed with methods used here to answer these questions, and in the main part of my talk, I will explain the results paper by paper. So um, this study is based on many previously published studies that discussed effects of reservoir parameters on a fluid and heat flow um, around cooling magmatic intrusions with focus on supercritical fluids. The diagram here on the left represents a simplified um, heat and mass transfer model for cooling basaltic intrusions. And the screenshot here represents um, the system immediately after the emplacement. At the incipient or early stage of geothermal system, the cooling intrusion reheats the circulating groundwater system, um, which results in formation of boiling liquid and vapor plume with temperature about 300 degrees Celsius, and um, formation of supercritical fluids right in the vicinity of the intrusion. At the maturate or main stage of the geothermal system, the heat um, from the intrusion still supports the formation of supercritical fluids in the vicinity of the intrusion. Then uh, the subcritical fluids begin to, form, begin to form convection cells, and then the boiling plume proceeds, um, uh, propagates towards the surface. At the late stage, the geothermal system cools down. So this is therefore how we see an active volcanic geothermal systems with supercritical fluids. There is a shallow intrusion that is cooling down, reheating the groundwater system and forming supercritical fluids. These supercritical fluids might also mix with uh, magmatic gases exhaled from the cooling intrusion. Then there are subcritical convecting fluids um, that um, at the, in the upload zone, uh, when they're rising towards the surface, might also boil. So now I'm going to project the main processes onto a um, enthalpy, temperature, and pressure phase diagram of water. Here, the subcritical fluids are um, res represented by the white and gray color. The white stands for the single phase liquid or single phase vapor, and the gray for uh, liquid and vapor. And supercritical fluids are here marked with the uh, pink color. So convecting metallic groundwater here, marked as subcritical fluid source, is heated up by a um, cooling intrusion at conditions close to isobaric. This leads to a heat increase here expressed as an enthalpy, and then boiling of these fluids to supercritical conditions, here marked with a black square. This is path number one, supercritical fluid formation. Then these supercritical fluids might also mix with magmatic gases. Um, this is uh, expressed here with the white arrows. And then in the unflow zone, as the supercritical fluid rises towards the surface, um, enthalpy of the fluid, and then also pressure drops, which results in supercritical fluid condensation. This is path number two. And then um, this condensate might mix with variable ratio uh, with shallower subcritical convecting fluids. This is path number three. But um, supercritical fluids have been, or supercritical conditions, have been also reported from several active geothermal systems in Italy, Iceland, Japan, United States, Mexico, or Kenya. 
Um, the bottom hole temperatures here from these wells are projected onto a diagram of temperature and depth with here um, highlighted a region of supercritical fluids with pink and then also IDDP1 fluids, uh, which are the fluids that I'm going to discuss later in my talk. So in my project, I focused mostly on supercritical fluid formation in Icelandic geothermal systems, as some of these geothermal fluids have been already investigated for supercritical fluids. Project that aimed to extract energy and fluids out of the geothermal system is called Icelandic Deep Drilling Project, IDDP. Within this project, there have been already two wells, sorry, two wells drilled. The first one in, uh, in 2009, um, IDDP1 at Krapla, with a temperature 440 degrees and enthalpy 3,200 kilojoules per kilogram at 2.1 kilometer depth. Then almost two years, uh, 10 years after, there was a second well drilled at Reykjanes, which uh, with temperature at least 426 degrees at 4.5 kilometers. So there is a lot of known already about the reservoir conditions related to supercritical fluids and supercritical fluid formation. But what is still missing is an information about uh, chemical and mineral mineralogical changes related to formation of these fluids. And this became a general topic of my thesis. So the specific research questions that shaped my project are, first of all, what are the fluid geochemical and mineralogical changes during supercritical fluid formation? Second, what are the processes that control supercritical fluid composition? Then, what are the effects of supercritical fluids on shallower subcritical fluids? And then also, does the composition of subcritical reservoir fluids affect chemical characteristics of supercritical fluids? So the first part of um, my project was summarized in the article published in Geothermics in 2019, Supercritical Fluids Around Magmatic Intrusions, IDDP1 at Krapla. Um, the, the main research questions that we aim to answer here are what are the fluid geochemical and mineralogical changes during supercritical fluid formation? And what are the effects of supercritical fluid on shallower subcritical fluids? To answer these questions, we have first estimated pressure, temperature, and enthalpy path for fluid flow around the shallow cooling intrusion of basaltic composition with a focus on supercritical fluid formation using hydrotherm software. These reservoir conditions were further used um, for a geochemical model that has been done in two steps. First, to recalculate any vapor enthalpy changes using watch, and then further uh, these um, recalculated Re-equilibrated composition, um, sorry, the, this recalculated co composition was further used um, in Flixi um, to re-equilibrate re this composition for um, selected secondary minerals to estimate related secondary mineralogy. Results of the geochemical model was also compared with sampled subcritical and supercritical fluids from Krapla. <coughs> So um, this slide might look familiar to you, as I mentioned that already earlier in the introduction, but I want to repeat the key information uh, from these two diagrams as the next slides will build on the processes discussed here. So the left diagram shows our hydrotherm heat and um, mass transfer model for cooling shallow basaltic intrusion at two kilometers depth uh, with suggested flow paths. The main flow regimes considered here where the supercritical fluid formation by conductive heat addition and boiling, then um, condensation of supercritical fluids in the um, upflow zone, and then mixing with shallower convecting sub, uh, subcritical fluids, which is path number three. In the next slide, I will follow this scheme and show the results of our geochemical model for each part. So first, what is the fluid chemistry and associated secondary mineralogy related to supercritical fluid formation? I will explain this separately for non-volatile and volatile elements using a, um, an example of silica and CO2. In both cases, I will project the results onto a diagram of concentration as a function of enthalpy and compare the result also 
with sampled subcritical and supercritical fluids from Krapla. So as soon as the subcritical fluid begins to boil, which is shown here uh, by a black line, the solubility of non-volatile element drops to concentration comparable with measured IDDP1 fluids. These results compare well also with some of the subcritical fluids from Krepler, but some of these subcritical fluids show a trend of phase segregation. This is what happens when the fluid begins to boil and liquid separates from vapor, and vapor mixes with a shallower subcritical fluid. In case of CO2, boiling of subcritical fluids leads to partitioning between the liquid and vapor, and the liquid fraction becomes undersaturated with respect to carbonates, and therefore CO2 does not precipitate into secondary minerals. And the um, concentration of um, CO2 is then, at subcritical condi supercritical conditions, is comparable with subcritical flu fluid source. These results also compare well with measured IDP1 fluids and some of the measured Krapla subcritical fluids, while, again, some of these fluids show a, fa a, a trend of phase segregation. So in summary, supercritical fluid composition is characterized by comparable volatile concentration uh, with subcritical fluids, while um, there is low uh, concentration of non-volatile elements due to precipitation of these non-volatile elements into secondary minerals. The related um, secondary mineralogy consists of sodium, potassium, magnesium, iron, aluminum silicates, calcium silicates, and quartz. So here's again a comparison of molot and measured fluids, supercritical fluids, um, in this case in the numbers. So the left side of the table shows subcritical geothermal fluid source um, from Krepla at temperature 300 degrees Celsius, with dominant comp component being silica, sodium, carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, and H2S. The right side of the table shows measured and modeled supercritical fluids. And uh, the supercriti me measured supercritical fluids are characterized by um, concentration of CO2 and H2S chlorine and boron comparable with subcritical uh, geothermal fluids, while the concentration of non-volatile here is much lower. This compares well with our modeled supercritical fluids, and therefore this suggests, it might potentially suggest, that uh, measured IDDP1 fluids were formed by conducted uh, conductive heat addition and boiling of these um, convecting some critical fluids. The last sub-question of this part was, how do the fluid chemistry and secondary energy look like during supercritical fluid condensation and mixing with shallow subcritical fluids? As the subcritical fluid ascends the surface, the, the fluid begins to condense into liquid. As the fir first droplet forms, non-volatile elements enter the liquid, which will cause a high concentration of chlorine and low pH. This composition of the first condensate is similar to the composition of measured acid fluid at Krapla, here shown with the white circles, uh, which suggests that these acid fluids might also potentially form by condensation of supercritical fluids. And then as the condensation proceeds, the condensate begins to um, react also with the host drug and mix with um, shallower fluids, which overprints the chemical characteristics of original supercritical fluids. The concentration of volatile elements in the condensate is slow as the solubility of the volatile components in the liquid is lower than in the case of non-volatiles. The second part of the project was summarized in article Supercritical Fluid Geochemistry in Geothermal System. This article has been published in Geofluids in 2019. And the main research question, the first one, is uh, the same as in um, the, first, uh, the first part, what are the fluid geochemical and mineralogical changes during supercritical fluid formation? And then the second question was, what processes are controlling supercritical fluid composition? To answer these questions, at this time, I have carried out a high temperature experiment to describe chemical and mineralogical changes during supercritical fluid formation. 
The inlet solution here was subcritical Krapla fluids that were pumped um, at a flow rate below 0.3 gram per minute into the first reactor, shown here on the picture. This, uh, this first reactor was supposed to simulate subcritical fluids and therefore was filled with basaltic glass and heated to 260 degrees. Then the fluids were flashed into the second reactor, which was supposed to simulate supercritical reservoir and therefore heated to 400 degrees. Here, um, I left a, a threaded rod to capture the precipitates that formed upon boiling. The pressure here was controlled by a back pressure regulator at 69 bars to keep the first reactor at subcritical conditions and then the second reactor at supercritical conditions. In total, I have run three experiments, the first one at subcritical conditions and two more at supercritical conditions. Then I have compared the experimental results also with the results of geochemical model and then also um, with uh, measured subcritical and supercritical fluids. So these diagrams show the experimental results for the composition of subcritical fluid source and then also for supercritical fluids. So the composition of subcritical fluid source um, corresponds to dilute geothermal fluids and the composition here is controlled by fluid rock equilibria at given conditions. At supercritical conditions, the concentration of non-volatile element drops while the concentration of uh, boron, CO2, and H2S is comparable with subcritical fluids. So the next sub-question was, how does the secondary mineralogy look like from sub to supercritical conditions? At subcritical conditions, at 260 degrees, the secondary mineralogy consists of calcium zeolites, iron magnesium chlorides, sodium potassium feldspar. At supercritical conditions at 400 degrees, the dominant mineral here is quartz and um, amorphous silica, sodium potassium feldspar, volastonite, and occasionally salt. Two dif different trends of elemental behavior are also demonstrated by recalculation of relative mobility for each, each element from sub to supercritical conditions. As seen previously, the non-volatile non elements, such as silica, calcium, sodium, potassium, aluminum, and chloride, uh, chlorine, precipitate into secondary minerals and therefore become immobile, while boron, CO2, and H2S partition into the vapor phase, and thus their con um, concentration at supercritical conditions is comparable with subcritical fluids, and they are mobile at these conditions. So the last sub-question sub of the second part was, how do our experimental and modeling results compare with measured Krapla geothermal fluids and IDDP1? I will go over the results for non-volatile elements first, using silica as an example, and then I will go over the results for volatile elements using an example of boron. The lines here show predicted concentration by geochemical model for conductive heat addition and boiling. The dotted line represents predicted solubility at supercritical conditions for pressure from 50 to 200 bars, and the triangles here show Krapla subcritical and supercritical fluids. In the case of silica, at liquid conditions, the concentration is controlled by silica solubility, but as the boiling proceeds, the, sil the silica concentration drops, and at um, subcritical to supercritical phase boundary controlled um, by Quartz solubility. This compares well with IDDP1 fluids and also some of these uh, subcritical Krapla fluids. While some of the uh, subcritical fluids have a higher concentration of silica, uh, which is caused by the phase aggregation, as discussed earlier. So, how do our experimental and modeling results compare with the Krapla fluids for volatile elements? To compare this, the results, I will use an example of boron. At the sub to supercritical phase boundary, boron is partitioning between the liquid and vapor. And then as boron does not precipitate into secondary minerals, the concentration remains the same at both sub or, and supercritical conditions. These results compare well 
with the IDDP1 and then also measured Krapla subcritical fluids. So the last part of my project was summarized in article geochemical constraints on supercritical, supercritical fluids in geothermal systems. This article has been accepted for publication in Journal of Volcanology and Geothermal Research in February 2020. The main question here was whether a subcritical reservoir fluid composition affects the chemical composition of supercritical geothermal fluids. To answer this question, I have run again a high temperature experiment with variable subcritical fluid composition to estimate the effect of subcritical fluid source on chemical char characteristics of supercritical fluids. The high temperature experiment was run in the same manner as described for the methods of the second paper, just using one reactor that was heated to 400 degrees and absorbed pressure from 34 to 69 bars. The inlet solution here was um, sample low temperature spore studier and high temperature Krapla geothermal water um, to simulate supercritical uh, for fluid formation at the rift zones and then uh, spied Krapla fluids um, as a analog for subcritical saline fluids exposed to magmatic degassing to simulate supercritical fluid formation at subduction zones. The experimental results were further also compared with geochemical model for given conditions already described in the first and second part, and then also compared with um, measured data from uh, some of the natural systems. So first here are the experiment, experimental results for the supercritical fluid composition with variable uh, composition of the subcritical fluid source. Subcritical fluid source um, is here marked uh, with a star, supercritical fluid with a circle. Our experimental results show that in case of dilute and NaCl CO2 rich fluids, the concentration of non-volatile drops, while the concentration of volatile is comparable with subcritical fluids. In case of uh, NaCl HCl uh, rich fluids, this is the red color here, the trend is similar for volatile elements and then majority of uh, non-volatile elements as well, while the concentration of chlorine here is comparable with subcritical fluid source. So how does the secondary mineralogy look like? In the case of dilute subcritical fluid source, the alteration mineralogy looks similar, showing mostly amorphous silicon quartz, zeolites, volastonite, and occasionally salt. In case of the saline CO2 rich fluids, alteration sequence consists mostly of sodium aluminum silicates, sodium silicates, highlight, and occasionally quartz. Boiling of um, HCl rich saline fluids led to intense corrosion and therefore um, no, visible, no visible traces of secondary minerals were observed after the rod was removed from the reactor. And so how do our results compare with natural system? First, I'm going to compare the results using an example of silica. And then I will move um, to chlorine. In all, in all cases, the concentration of silica is controlled by fluid mineral equilibria and decreases towards the sub to supercritical phase boundary. These results compare, uh, these results compare well with experimental data and natural system, which suggests that the supercritical fluids in the system in Lardero, Los Homeros, Menengai, Krapla, and the Geysirs are formed by conductive heat addition and boiling of subcritical fluids. And then what about chlorine? So in the case of uh, chlorine in dilute and silane CO2 rich fluids, the concentration drops due to chlorine precipitation into halite or selvite, unless the subcritical uh, fluid source contain higher concentration of HCl. A comparison of our experimental data with chlorine concentration in natural system shows that the chlorine is higher in the fluids of many system, meaning that there was an external source of HCl that contributed um, to this process, possibly magmatic degassing. So in conclusion, what are the fluid geochemical and mineralogical changes during supercritical fluid formation? 
loss of non-volatile elements into secondary minerals, while volatile con element concentration remains the same. What are the processes that control supercritical fluid composition? Liquid vapor partitioning into secondary mineral for solubility from subcritical to supercritical conditions. And what are the effects of supercritical fluids on shallow subcritical fluids? Decrease in the pH and non-volatile concentration. And does a composition of subcritical reservoir fluids affect chemical characteristics of supercritical fluids? Yes, it does. So I would like to um, thank Landswirkion and um, Swiss National Science Foundation uh, for funding this project. And I would also like to uh, thank to many people that contributed to this project, helping me to discover the world of science and supercritical fluids. I would also like to, uh, I would like to also thank to my friends that were always ready uh, to take me for a hike or just a beer sometimes. And then special thanks to my family to Dave, and also Dave's family. You are extremely patient with me, and I really do appreciate that. Thank you. Well, thank you, Matilda. Uh, now we proceed. And... Uh, uh, Luigi, do you, can you hear us? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Excellent, we can hear you. And uh, thank you for taking part and, uh, uh, from this remote location. But uh, uh, now we proceed. And uh, so I now ask you to uh, take over and ask uh, questions. Can and Matilda, uh, you'll just be, be here. Okay. This is your place. And uh, I'll try to keep uh, switching if, if you need. So you just, okay. uh, if you want to show something, then you just, uh, uh, then I, I, I will do the switching. So, uh, Luigi, you start. Okay, so uh, good afternoon uh, to everybody. Good afternoon uh, uh, to Matilda, and thank you for your clear presentation. Um, I was not able to see the slides, but I could follow your presentation because I read uh, uh, the PhD thesis. Uh, and so uh, I will take as basis uh, your PhD thesis. Um, I must say, first of all, that you have done uh, a, a, a great job. You have done uh, uh, a lot of uh, experimental work uh, in the laboratory. You have done uh, a lot of modeling uh, um, of different type, um, including uh, fluid flow model, uh, geochemical modeling, uh, and you have done a lot of analytical work, actually, I saw, using different instruments, uh, sampling fluids, uh, analyzing also minerals. And uh, in the end, uh, you have also uh, written uh, Three papers published. I, I understand that also the third one has been published. No? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that's uh, that's great. And first of all, uh, I must congratulate you for all the work you've done. Thank you. Um, the task uh, was not easy and was uh, something, let's say, unusual uh, because uh, I don't think there are many studies uh, uh, concerning this uh, the chemical aspect uh, of. Uh, supercritical fluid. So, uh, uh, I am in an um, unusual situation for me because I don't like to be the, the, the bad guy, but uh, I have to do it uh, uh, this afternoon. Uh, uh, so, Go for it. please excuse me. Uh, perhaps I will be a little bit frank, uh, uh, in, but uh, that is part of the, of the job. But uh, I, uh, I must say once again that it, I appreciate really very much what you have done, your research, the result of your research. Um, okay, looking at the, um, at the thesis, I've seen, uh, for instance, that uh, you wrote that uh, the use of uh, uh, supercritical fluids uh, uh, could potentially increase the power production per uh, each geothermal well. 
up to 3050 megawatt electrical due to the increased specific enthalpy, the lower viscosity and density of supercritical fluids. And this is really something that uh, uh, is a hope, I think, is a sort of dream. But uh, uh, I would like to, to comment on this uh, uh, hope that uh, uh, for what concerns the specific enthalpy, this is true for pure water. I mean, uh, if you look uh, at the specific enthalpy of uh, uh, liquid pure water at the critical point, uh, the value is uh, uh, 2,099 kilojoule per kilogram. But uh, uh, so at 300, let's say, at 374 uh, up degrees C approximately, that is the value of the enthalpy of pure liquid water. But if you take uh, liquid seawater at the same temperature, the specific enthalpy is only 1,700 and 57 kilojoules per kilogram. So this hope uh, of having more energy is, uh, is true if, uh, if you have uh, a pure water or a very dilute fluid. Would you like to comment on this, Matilda, please? Yeah, I would definitely like to comment on that. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank you for all the um, constructive comments that you actually sent to me and that definitely improved the thesis. Um, I really do appreciate also that you spent so much time with my thesis. Uh, second, yeah, I would definitely like to comment also on your question about uh, the um, power production of these wells. So you are totally right about this. Uh, the estimate that I've used in the thesis is based on the articles published before. So I haven't done the calculations personally. Um, so, uh, or I have tried to calculate that, uh, but I, the estimate comes from a uh, published paper. Um, so the question, if I understand it correctly, the question, uh, your question is if the power production of the wells uh, with not dilute fluids, but instead saline fluids is going to be similar. Is this correct? Yeah, it's, uh, the enthalpy will depend uh, on the salt content. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, dramatically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, like of, of course for saline fluids, the uh, critical, uh, the the value of the critical temperature is going to be higher, and then also um, the enthalpy. So of course in this case, the temperature have has to be higher uh, to obtain the same power production from these wells. Yeah. And this has an implication, I think, also if you look uh, at the Iceland uh, deep drilling project. Uh, yeah. I'm not sure I'm saying it in the correct way, but uh, I mean, one of the sites where uh, I've been already uh, performing deep drilling is, uh, um, I do not remember the name, the one close to the sea, uh, Reykjanes. Yeah. Reykjanes, I think, no? Uh, Reykjanes, uh, the, 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 the fluid uh, feeding, uh, infiltrating in the geothermal system is seawater. Therefore, uh, if you drill there uh, uh, and you actually find the supercritical seawater, then uh, the, the, you cannot expect a big power production. But I don't know, this is something that you might uh, consider when you plan uh, to drill uh, in future. Yeah, exactly. But um, in case of Reykjanes, I'm actually not sure if the temperature is already fully estimated as the first estimate was at least 426 degrees. And then uh, the later estimates uh, published by Enrico Belli um, were higher, much higher. Mm, OK. So uh, then uh, one of the main points uh, that uh, uh, I underscored uh, in my uh, in my comments to your thesis uh, is the use uh, of the word uh, supercritical. And I would like to return on this point because uh, I think it's something uh, um, very important uh, from the terminological point of view. Because uh, I think that we have to speak in the and write in the correct way, use the correct term, use the proper terms. Um, and I think that uh, uh, you use it sometimes, not always, but sometimes you use the, the, 
the word supercritical uh, or supercritical fluid in, uh, in, in a way which is not completely correct. Uh, sorry for that, but uh, I want to say that, let's say, if we have, uh, if we have uh, uh, a fluid which is at uh, a temperature higher than the critical point, then uh, we can uh, change the pressure, we can compress the fluid, but this gas uh, will not condense. Uh, on the contrary, if we are below the critical temperature, then uh, uh, if we compress properly the fluid, uh, it will condense. That is the in my opinion, this is uh, the correct uh, way to look uh, at the uh, problem. Uh, and therefore, if this is, uh, this is true, then uh, uh, the supercritical state uh, is something uh, uh, which pertains to each uh, substance, to each fluid uh, even. And in fact, uh, if you look uh, at the uh, UFAC, uh, uh, at the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry Gold Book. The definition of supercritical fluid is the state of a compound, mixture, or element above its critical pressure and critical temperature. So uh, I think that uh, you should be aware of this point uh, and uh, talk about. Uh, uh, fluid, uh, which are at the temperature higher than the critical temperature water, but you cannot, uh, if you want to, to be, uh, if you want to write uh, in a correct way, you cannot uh, speak uh, of supercritical fluid uh, if you do not define the critical temperature and pressure of that particular fluid. Yeah. I don't know if uh, I was clear enough uh, because. <laughs> Something. No, so no, no, no. You were you were uh, really clear. So I am aware of this problem since 2014, um, because we have been discussing this um, issue since I started this PhD, and I think that we still didn't come up with really a best solution for everyone. So uh, when we started, we actually started with superheated, then it switched to supercritical. There was also an option of super hot. Um, and I feel like every single person has totally different opinion about it. Um, of course, there are there is there are, um, there are um, expression or the termino terminology is very uh, well described in um, from Liebscher um, and also somewhere else. Uh, but uh, in my case, it just boiled down to uh, the fact that if you go to the field, then this is very difficult to say if it's super critical, super heated, uh, because quite often the pressure is not known at the bottom of um, the well. Uh, so uh, you cannot really differentiate here is still super heated, still, uh, here is super critical. And then also um, the chemistry at the moment is not uh, really clear yet. The same thing with uh, the lab experiment. Um, so then we just decided to uh, risk it and just to go for supercritical and facing all these questions. Hmm. Yes, but I am, uh, and I am ever still, uh, I'm not totally convinced <laughs> on the proper way to use uh, to use this term. Uh, anyhow, I know that uh, I mean it is accepted uh, in the in the geochemical community. But strictly speaking, uh, if you refer to the uh, UPAC uh, Gold Book, uh, we. I think it's a, it's a common reference because we are geochemists, but actually when yeah. we look at this matter, we should have a, a sort of dictionary. Yeah. And this sort of dictionary for me is the UPAC, the Union, uh, uh, the International Union of uh, Pure and Applied Chemistry, Gold Book. So there, uh, in that book, you find the definition. Uh, this is the dictionary. And uh, I think that uh, you should, uh, yeah. you should, you should be consistent with that. But of course, this is my point of view then, uh, I mean. Uh, but apart from the terminological point, point of view then, there is also another aspect, uh, uh, the existence of uh, the supercritical fluids uh, in nature. 
in the natural system. And this is something that, uh, uh, well, I have discussed uh, for the first time, uh, probably in uh, 1979 uh, or something like that, uh, because uh, at that time uh, in Italy, uh, people, the AGIP, the, the oil company of Italy, drilled uh, uh, deep geothermal wells close to Naples in the Flegrea Fields area. Uh, the well was, was called San Vito One, San Vito First, and uh, it found the temperature um, higher than 420 degrees C at, uh, at well bottom. I was not there uh, during the, the test uh, in, in that case, but uh, uh, a friend of mine were there, and they, they were really very scared because uh, of the uh, high pressure, high temperature, uh, possible failure of material, and so on. But uh, uh, their salinity is probably so high that uh, in that case, uh, I don't think uh, the, that there, there can be uh, super critical fluids because uh, the salinity is too high, so the critical point uh, uh, of this fluid is much higher than uh, 400, uh, perhaps it's over 450 or something like that. But in any case, uh, it would be great. Uh, it would be a, a very nice thing to have the possibility to find true supercritical fluid in a natural system because that means uh, that you have a sort of gas uh, and uh, if you change the, the pressure of this gas, uh, nothing, nothing happens. I mean, it doesn't react. And so you can use it as a perfect fluid to extract energy. But actually, if you look at the, te at the well testing you have done in, in the deep digging project in Iceland, I think you have got a lot of problems uh, of scaling, corrosion, things like that. And uh, therefore, uh, that suggests me that uh, the fluids were not really supercritical fluid. Uh, can you please, uh, perhaps you know much better than me the situation of the Icelandic, uh, you, you mentioned already something about the Icelandic wells uh, in your presentation. Uh, can you say something on this? Uh, comment again something on this, uh, on the existence or not, uh, in your opinion, of the supercritical fluids, uh, properly said supercritical fluids. Um, sorry, can you repeat the question? The question is, do you think uh, uh, that in nature uh, is possible to find supercritical fluids properly? I mean, supercritical fluids, I mean uh, fluids that uh, if you change the pressure, if, if you increase the pressure, they do not condense. So, uh, based on the, the models, the heat and trans uh, heat and mass transfer models um, I would say yes um, especially related to the volcanic um, systems or um, shallow intrusions and uh, based on the paper from Sam Scott and co-authors uh, usually at depth uh, like below sorry uh, yeah shallower than six kilometers under the surface yes did, it, did I answer your question? So you think that is it possible to find supercritical fluid in the natural system? Yes. Okay. No, because for me it's something uh, for me it's something different. I um, I would <laughs> it's something that for me is something in, in, in very difficult to define. I mean, you can find the supercritical fluid as you define the supercritical fluid, but not. Uh, a true supercritical fluid because the supercritical fluid should be at the temperature and pressure higher than its own, its proper critical uh, temperature and critical pressure. Do you see the difference? Yeah, um, so um, maybe I can uh, now switch to, or you, no, you will not see the, uh, you will not see the slides. Um, so maybe if you look at the thesis, um, yeah. then on the page number three, I will try to find it 
No, we cannot switch. If you, no. you switch at your side, then at the switch. She has the page number. No. Uh, which, sorry, which? Yeah, okay, thanks. She wants so, to Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, just let me find the diagram of temperature and depth. Oops, oh, here we are. It's like, here we are. So um, I would say that uh, if you are talking about uh, fluids with temperature and pressure above the critical point, right? Then um, you can actually find these uh, fluids in nature already uh, with some of them, for example, I would say IDDP2 or in Japan, in Kakonda. And um, it is characterized by a very high salinity, and therefore uh, the critical point of that fluid uh, is probably very, very high. It might be over yeah. 500, perhaps over 600 degrees here. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, but because when you increase the salinity, the critical point of the fluid uh, will increase uh, dramatically, and therefore. Uh, uh, if you, I mean, the definition of the supercritical state uh, depends uh, on the critical point of that particular fluid. And then, uh, if you have uh, even a very simple fluid similar to sodium chloride uh, to the binary sodium chloride water system, then you might have uh, a solution of uh, two different uh, phases. Yeah. And therefore, uh, uh, you don't oh. have uh, a yeah. I mean, a, a simple, I mean, the situation becomes a, a, a very complicated yeah. in the natural system. That, that's why I think that uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to, to find, uh, to, to have a, a true super, a supercritical condition in the natural system. Yeah, I, yeah I, I see now what you mean. Um, see. Yeah. Um, Good question. I don't know. <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> I think that it's uh, really very difficult to, to answer this, uh, this question. And I think that everyone can, uh, uh, can have his own idea. And, but it's something on which uh, perhaps you can uh, think about and, uh, and, and, and find some new ideas then to develop. Then another point, uh, if I have still have time, uh, concern uh, uh, the, the thermodynamic database. Uh, this is something uh, on which uh, I, I mean, during, during my research uh, I've done in the past, uh, uh, many times uh, I had uh, uh, the, the I, I discussed it about uh, the, the problem of the thermodynamic database. And when you use, uh, when you do geochemical modeling and you use a thermodynamic database, I think that the most important point uh, is to have uh, a, a, a database that is uh, internally consistent. I mean that, do you agree, I think, no? yeah, on yeah, this point? Yeah, yeah. So uh, when you, I, uh, when I read your thesis, uh, I saw that uh, you essentially use the thermodynamic database uh, from what you have, what you for F and uh, uh, Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory (LLNL), but uh, you took some uh, mineral uh, pro thermodynamic properties, the thermodynamic property of some mineral from other publication from other authors, from other database. 
So the problem is that when you take something from uh, another place and you put uh, in, in the database you are using, you should test uh, for the thermodynamic consistency, for the internal, uh, internal consistency of the thermodynamic database. And I think that this is a huge work. I don't know if you have done uh, this check uh, or not. So, um, yeah, it's totally correct that uh, the database was updated on um, some of the secondary minerals. And it was due to the fact that um, recently there have been some experimental studies on uh, the secondary minerals. and. Um, um, people like Alex Kisi and the others uh, then updated uh, the database of uh, or the list of the secondary minerals and then um, just to uh, keep it consistent with conditions in Iceland and for basaltic systems, I decided to use these, uh, this um, database instead of using Botec uh, in this case or LL and L database. Yes, uh, but uh, uh, did you check for the internal consistency or uh, uh, you, did, you did not check? I did not. Okay. No, this is something that, uh, but this is something that is normally done. I mean, because checking for the internal consistency is a huge work. Uh, but this is uh, just uh, uh, another opportunity I would like to underscore the, the need for uh, a common database. It's something, also this is it, a sort of chimera, it's something that is it, it's difficult to, it's a very complicated goal uh, to achieve. Uh, but I, I think that uh, you are at the beginning of a career, uh, of a scientific career. You have, you have seen uh, the importance of geochemical modeling. And so I would like to, to ask you also to, to be aware of this important point. Uh, something that uh, uh, we were not able to achieve. I started to work with uh, uh, thermodynamics uh, when I was uh, uh, 20, uh, 25 years old, something like that. And uh, at the end, uh, I am in a situation more or less uh, at that uh, I was uh, at the beginning of my career. So perhaps uh, that is something that you could try together with uh, your colleague uh, to, to improve. Um, yeah, so I'm actually moving to France where I'm going to work on something similar to that, updating the database, um, in this case actually kinetic database. So I will definitely think about this as well. Good. Uh, that's, uh, for me, I think uh, that's all, uh, um, that were the, the, the question and also the comment, uh, the, the discussion uh, that uh, I thought it to have together with you. And once again, uh, uh, Matilda, congratulations for uh, your study, for your research. Uh, that's all for the moment, <laughs> okay. Thank you for your questions and comments. You're welcome. Thank you, Luigi. Now we switch uh, to uh, you follow the proceedings, and uh, now we switch to uh, Haltor. And uh, Okay, Dr. Alasperant, Head of Faculty, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I'd like to begin to thank Matilda for her excellent presentation. And uh, uh, I don't really want to be a bad guy rather than <laughs> Luigi. And, uh, but having read Matilda's thesis and listened to her dissertation, I feel that the term opponent is a bit of a misnomer, as there is not much I 
I'm opposing in this uh, thesis or finding fault with. Now, in the memorandum for opponents, the role of the opponent is described as critically reviewing the dissertation with respect to the project as a whole and these four items, that is to say significance, methods, treatment of results, and conclusions. Well, I have also added what I think is important, suggestions for further studies. Now, I, I can quickly go through those. I think this uh, thesis has a lot of scientific merit. Um, it is, it is there's quite a lot of novelty, and I hope that the results might be used in an e economic way. The methods, the programs, and uh, the experiments done were quite well established methods, but are used in a novel way in this context. And the treatment of results is, is very good. Uh, and the conclusions are logical with reference to the results. And also, there are some useful suggestions for further studies. So, but I'm not going to stop here. Um, it is rather interesting that the first thing I wanted to ask about, I think Luigi has actually uh, <laughs> come up with, and that is to say, what is the definition of, of uh, supercritical fluids, which, as we have heard, is something that has de been debated and everybody is certainly not uh, agreed upon. Um, I wonder if Matilda would like to add something on this. There was something she said in the thesis that uh, the UPAC definition of uh, uh, by temperature and, and critical temperature and critical pressure and it says that this definition would uh, lead to an artificial and unphysical boundary in the phase diagram of water across which there is a continuous region of single phase fluids and also explain probably better the rule of pressure in, in the definition you are using. So, um, yeah. Um, first of all, yeah, I would like to comment on that farther. Um, but the thing is, uh, with this definition, when I started this project, uh, there were not too many people actually uh, working in this field and so there is still this ongoing discussion and I feel like uh, there is still a lot of work to be done and then most, maybe one of these tasks would be uh, to define uh, these terms or these fluids in a better way. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if we leave that for the time being, then we got this very important economic aspect of the project that, as is, has been stated, that production from a single high temperature well is two to five megawatts, but utilization of fluids could potential power, power production per well up for, of up to 30 to 50 megawatts. Now, of course, I expect we would have more expensive wells, but once you start producing, there's probably the cost of operation is probably not all that different. But uh, I want to just uh, approach the subject of the technology. Is, is it the same technology that would be used for uh, construction and operation of a geothermal power station that would use supercritical fluids, or would you probably be converting the super, subcritical, supercritical 
fluid to subcritical vapor and then use it in a, a conventional power plant. And in any of these processes, would you be losing energy or what would be the main operational problems? So, um, I am uh, not really an expert in the technological no, no. part of uh, this uh, topic, but I think that the biggest, or my understanding of that is that the biggest problem so far was really the corrosion and scaling within the well. And therefore, um, I think there is still ongoing research about the uh, metal corrosion and which really which metals or which materials used for the wells. And then also, I think, um, in um, these wells discharging supercritical fluids or uh, the fluids with temperature above critical point, um, they have to use the cladding to prevent the corrosion in the well, etc. Um, in terms of uh, in terms of the uh, power plants, I'm not sure really how to answer that. Well, as, as far as I have seen, I think people are considering conventional power plants after converting the the fluid to 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 uh, to sub. This would be critical main, yeah. vapor. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we go. Yes, here, here I've got just some questions. I, I, I liked it how you were, how you chose the natural substances used for the experiments, and but I would like to have a small sort of. Uh, uh, explanation from you on why you chose basaltic glass from Stapafet. Is it because its composition is particularly homogeneous or is it distribution extensive or is it also because it has been extensively uh, or thoroughly studied previously? And yeah. Also, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, you so the reason why we have used basaltic glass or yeah, the reason uh, for that was, yeah, because um, the composition is very well known, uh, very well studied, and then also it represents um, an average um, composition or um, host drug composition um, in Iceland to simulate really uh, this is pro these pro processes at um, rift zone. So this was the main reason, but actually like the point when I was running the experiment was really uh, just to simulate the um, the subcritical reservoir at Karapla just um, and to obtain the, the composition that would reflect these conditions. So the highlight was not really on the basaltic glass, if it's basaltic glass or basalt, but it was really mostly um, to get the composition that's comparable with Karapla fluids. Okay, and uh, on the same similar notes, well, I, I must say I was quite happy to see that you're using Spoas, but that is because that is something that is very familiar to us that have worked on Icelandic geothermal fluids. In fact, it's been in, in the labs I've been working in, been used as a reference sample for decades. And uh, it's a very sort of homogeneous and, and uh, always the same composition. So I would like to hear wh whether uh, this is not probably your same opinion. Uh, you mean same opinion about that, that this is, you know, or, or you, you just tell me how you chose it? Yeah, um, so uh, the idea was uh, to simulate um, a different stages of geothermal systems uh, or of, yeah, of uh, geothermal systems as I explained that in the beginning of the um, introduction where you have the young system and then the maturate system. So uh, then in this case, the SPOA study seemed to be like a good choice to uh, simulate uh, supercritical fluid formation uh, using a low temperature geothermal system or low temperature geothermal fluids, uh, which SPOA study just seemed to, be, uh, to fit perfectly. Yes, so here we are probably back to 
Luigi again, but uh, I'd like to consider the, uh, because probably uh, drilling of IDTP2 and, and the work on IDTP2 is probably uh, a little probably recent for your consideration, but I noticed this statement in research article two, that at present discharges from IDTP2 at surface are not characterized by supercritical temperatures. Thus, deep reservoir fluid composition has been estimated from fluid inclusion analysis of felsic veins consisting of a vapor phase dominated by water, chloride-rich brine, so, uh, and iron and potassium chloride, sylvite halide, solid solutions, and sulfides. And it is Bali et al. that is uh, referenced there. But have you sort of had a look at this composition because this, I think, comes into what Luigi was discussing about the effect of um, saline solutions and, and the, their critical fluids and whether you can produce from them. And, and have you considered the composition there and matched it with your experimental results of, of how a, a saline system would react? Yeah. yeah. So uh, it would be great to uh, consider this composition but if I remember correctly, um, these results came out after I finished my experimental aspect. study, yeah. so uh, or experiment. So um, this would be this is something that we discussed with Andre, and then also that this would be uh, like a definitely uh, good extension of this project um, to uh, to run experiments for saline system because this is not really like or fully saline system because this is not really so like. Yeah, um, I haven't uh, I haven't did, uh, done too much about this, mm. uh, but just because of the time constraints, I didn't have time, and therefore I could not go into this field. And then also the, these results came afterwards, so this is yeah, why uh, this is not considered in this in this thesis. Mm. Okay, yes, this was something that intrigued me in your papers. It was it, it's this you say concentrations of iron and magnesium in all fluid samples were close to the detection limit and or affected by contamination and were not considered further for the study. But however, I find that you are uh, listing results for iron and magnesium and uh, you are showing them in the, in the figures and also in the mineral fluid reactions in which they take part. I would like to get a better idea of the role of these two components in the, in the, in the general context. Right. Um, so first of all, the reason why um, iron was not considered in this study, or in the second and the third part of this study was that the threaded rod that was um, in the second reactor uh, was um, stainless steel 316. Yeah. And therefore, uh, like when we, uh, when I stopped the, the experiment and I took out the rod, I could see that some of the uh, part of the rod got corroded. And therefore, uh, we did not want to consider or rely on iron because uh, these, uh, the results were kind of, yeah, non, in, for this reason, non-reliable. The reason why um, iron, uh, this was because the concentration of that, of iron, uh, sorry, magnesium, um, sorry, um, was so low. Um, and then also the highlight was really mostly on silica, CO2, and chlorine to see really uh, the mobility or the elemental behavior at this sub to supercritical conditions. But you had no worry that uh, this uh, possible corrosion of iron might have disturbed other reactions or anything? Possibly. Yeah, possibly, yeah. So that's my point there. Now, I don't know whether this is really has a place in a doctoral <laughs> uh, defense, oh. but uh, it's just sort of general dredges of mine. Uh, <coughs> notice that you talk about elements and then you use that for CO2, H2S, SO4, SiO2, etc. Whereas I would say that I much prefer this to be confined to elements of the periodic table when you say element and 
rather use constituents yeah. or, Sorry, or, or obviously. This. <laughs> and uh, I would just recommend that you, if you have a chance of correcting that in future. You know. Was this in the thesis? Yes, this was in the thesis. Yeah. Sorry. It was even in your notes before, yes. uh, in your slides before. Uh, yeah, uh, there was a lot of stress today uh, for yeah. some reason. <laughs> and um, yeah, <laughs> sorry. And the other word which I also have some feelings about is to measure and, or measurement. You don't, I, I don't feel that you measure a concentration if you're doing a, say, like ICP plus mass spectrometry, you're doing a determination. Measurement is only, say, like pH or, or uh, conductivity where you put in a meter and re get one reading. Yeah, um, I feel like terminology is not really my strongest skill. Uh, no, <laughs> just, 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 just. Uh, and, and, and you're certainly not the only one. <laughs> I apologize for that. Yeah, so I will try to fix it in my uh, future yeah. research. Okay. But now if we just go to the main conclusions of your thesis, um, that supercritical fluids are formed by conductive heating of subcritical geothermal fluids with a minor addition of magmatic gas. Now, I would like if you could elaborate a little bit about the contribution or the role of magmatic gas, I felt there was probably not, not much uh, treatment of that there. So if you could sort of give us some. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, first of all, I am not saying that for all of them, I am saying uh, that uh, possibly for IDDP and then also some of the system that I've shown, uh, there might be a minor or addition of magmatic gases um, and so I don't want to say uh, which gases or which composition because this is, was not really the point of the thesis. The point of uh, the thesis was to see um, if actually we can recycle um, some of the, uh, these elements and components from the subcritical uh, reservoir or if we, if we actually need an additional input of some of these elements. And so because I focused on um, CO2 and um, chlorine, then in case of CO2, it can be recycled, while um, in case of chlorine, there has to be an additional input uh, into the supercritical fluids. Uh, yeah. OK. Yeah, well, the other, I think, a um, little characterized by low concentration non-volatile elements, but similar volatile element concentrations as a subcritical fluids. And also there's the pH, you, it, it is lowered. So, so this could have an effect in, in, in connection with the corrosion, etc. And we have uh, silica, aluminium, and si 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 silica, aluminium, silicates, and possibly salt. And what is, seems to be an important conclusion is that we've got similar trends in rift and subduction zones. And would you like to elaborate on that a bit? Because I think what you did for subduction zones was probably rather uh, hypothetical or... or Very uh, hypothetical, yeah. yeah. Uh, because, first of all, uh, the composition that uh, I used as an inlet solution was uh, spiked crapla fluids, so this was kind of a cheating. Yeah. But um, we just wanted to see the trends, uh, what would happen actually if we would use at least a similar um, uh, concentrations or a similar composition um, for a subduction zone. And then also we haven't really uh, dig deeper into what happens with sulfur, etc. So uh, there, uh, there is still a lot of work that uh, yeah. should be done about this, uh, but I just didn't have time yeah. to do that. Okay. And then, yeah. Well, so I just want to say that this was a well-executed comprehensive study of significant novelty, and I should say it deserves the granting of a doctoral degree to the university. Thank you. Thank you. So that's what I have to say. Well,
Thank you, uh, Dr. Luigi and Haldor. And this concludes the examination by the examiners uh, of the opponent of the opponents on on the candidate. Uh, well, if you, the audience, have uh, some questions, there is now the chance to ask. So please. Someone has to be first. <laughs> if they didn't, they, uh, they are afraid to, to, to acknowledge that here. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. If not, then this is uh, this is uh, this part is concluded, and uh, uh, now uh, me and the opponents will leave the room, and I think I'll do it this way. So you don't, I don't know what will happen if I keep it the other way. Then you might be listening to us. <laughs> in the room and so we are in uncharted waters uh, but uh, just uh, 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 okay uh, it's a highly technical job for me now and uh, but uh, you um, okay so uh, Luigi, we, we will now move to uh, you. Uh, you will come with us. We will uh, we will uh, carry you through to the to the other room, the Enhaldor, and there we will uh, discuss the the outcome. But the rest of you, you just wait here and, until we come back. And uh, I put. I thought I
solar hit, they do look a little bit. Okay. But it was a lot tiny like it Let's see if we see. Uh, Luigi, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I cannot see the video, but it's okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we are in a bit of the same same situation, but uh, we'll see if that can be sorted. Um, okay, I think we will just proceed with things as they are. Um, so. Uh, the following text has been documented and signed into the PhD registry of the Faculty of Earth Sciences. Doctorate from the Faculty of Earth Sciences, Matilda Herbanska, 3rd, 5th of March 2020. By resolution of the Faculty of Earth Sciences, Matilda Hermanska's dissertation, Geochemistry of Supercritical Fluids in Active Geothermal Systems, has been approved for, the doctor, for a doctoral defense in geology, the defense has been made, heard, and accepted. We therefore declare Matilda Hermanska a doctor of geology, philosophy a doctor from the University of Iceland. And in confirmation of the doctorate, I present to you, and this is, you'll get this in three languages, you may even know, well. know some Latin, uh, this uh, certificate. And congratulations. Thank you. And uh, so, uh, perhaps uh, now uh, the, uh, we don't seem to be able to uh, see uh, Luigi, but he can hear us. Maybe he wants to say a few words to Matilda now that she has officially passed. Sure. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, Matilda, uh, congratulations. You have done uh, a great job. Uh, and uh, I wish uh, really you have a very, very, very good uh, scientific career. All the best. Can I respond here? Uh, and Hanto, would you like to say something? Well, I'd just like to congratulate Matilda on an excellent work and uh, uh, all the best wishes for her future career. Okay, Matilda, would you like to say something? So um, I would like to thank Haldor and Luigi for uh, reading my thesis and commenting on the thesis. Um, I hope uh, we will meet at some point with Luigi and uh, I will have a chance to invite him for a beer that he is going to miss right now. Um, and I would like to thank everyone for uh, coming here and supporting me in this process because it has been quite a journey. Um, so uh, your help was really needed. <laughs> so thank you everyone. And now I would like to invite everyone for a beer to ask you. Okay. Uh Okay, uh, we are coming to a close, but I wish to thank the candidate for her presentation and her answers to the opponent's questions today. I also want uh, to give special thanks to the two distinguished opponents for taking their valuable time uh, to uh, judge the thesis and taking part in the ceremony. This is uh, the highest degree awarded in science, and it's of utmost importance that, that uh, we keep to the standards uh, required. So, thanks again. Dr. Matilda Hermanska, 
The Faculty of World Sciences wants you to accept this gift. It's a book on Iceland. It has even a picture of a geothermal area, so it's probably must very interesting. You can read this tonight before you go to bed. Okay. Uh, I'm sure that's what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, and so accept this with the well wishes from the faculty. Uh, and uh, that being said, I want to thank everybody for being here today and uh, want to mention that there is a reception in, on the third floor in Askja where we all should be heading and uh, so this uh, ceremony is over, this defense is over. Thank you. And Luigi, thank you and uh,